I talk to so many people who are in comedy in one way or the other, and everybody hones in on it right away, f fairly, fairly early, and that is not your trajectory. You were serious about uh, being a journalist. Yeah, dude, I was. You were a serious, uh, serious young man. I wanted to do sports, though. Let me add right. that caveat. I knew that I did not carry my dad's intensity. Right. And and mind you, the year before he died, when I was 15, I got my learner's permit. So I got to drive him to all of his speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. So I just sat and just watched him just go on stage and just spit fire for like a year and a half. Just churches and community centers and anything within three hours of Birmingham, I was the driver. And, and hey, boy, get off that Nintendo. Come take me to Tupelo. <laughs> wow. Just, okay. Yeah. And I would just sit and just watch him just destroy with just words. But I knew I couldn't do that. It wasn't until Kenny Maine, there's four people. It's Stuart Scott, it's Kenny Maine, it's Jenny Moose from CNN, mm -hmm. and this guy Van Earl Wright, who at the time was at CNN Headline News. I think he bounced around to a couple of the sports organizations. But those four people were kind of like the brain trust. And then an honorable mention to Fred Hickman, RIP. But like those people within journalism were fun and quirky. Jenny Moose did offbeat stories. Yep. She didn't really do sports. Right. But it was quirky, weird shit. I was like, all right, that's interesting. Stuart talks like me. Van Earl Wright would do that sports. And like, <laughs> that was the era. That was the era of he when Headline News was a 30-minute repeating broadcast. And mm -hmm. the sports section was 90 seconds. And they had a guy. And it's crazy to think about this now. But there was a guy at a time, people, where in 90 seconds, he had to give you the s score of every game of the big four sports in this country. Yeah, yeah. Ape shit like talking speed and some <laughs> bone thugs and harmony. <laughs> but he enunciated every word. He uh -huh. added humor. Sure. You know, the Jays down the Rays. Blah, blah, blah. Like no time for the score of the game. Just who won. Yep. Gangies fall to the Clippers. Clippers. Blah, 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 blah. Speaking of the Lakers, the Lakers, the Minneapolis. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, crazy to think we now have four ESPNs. You know, they're, yeah. they're, that's the way the culture's changed. It used to be, you've got 90 seconds to cover all of news. Because there was no ticker. Right, exactly. This idea of constant access to sports scores was fucking foreign in 1994. Yep. So you had to watch headline news. So, so I go to school and I'm like, okay, well, I'll just, I'll do journalism. This feels right. Mm-hmm. Ah, damn, it's the family business. Well, I didn't really plan on that because I really wanted to, what, what I wanted to be was like a firefighter up until like my senior year of high school. And then Stuart Scott was the thing that like finally pushed me over the edge. So I get to school. I start doing journalism classes. Part of the prerequisites for journalism classes are theater classes for voice and diction. Oh. Um, and public speaking, you had to take a public speaking class as well. And within the public speaking class, you had to take, um, you, you had to take um, impromptu speaking. That was like a month of coursework mm -hmm. was impromptu speaking. So during that month of impromptu speaking, the teacher would give you a, a subject. You go out in the hall for 90 seconds or three minutes, whatever she gave you. And you come back in and give a speech on that topic as if you were an expert. So it was like improvised TED Talks. And every time I did it, I got a laugh. Yeah. Because I didn't know what I was doing. And it was clear I didn't know what I was doing to the point where the teacher accused me of trying to, you know, you're making fun of this. And I'm like, I'm not. I'm, I don't know why they laugh. They just laugh. But I also knew that I liked the fact that they laughed. Yeah. So I would come back in and that was the manipulation again. Well, that's just, you know, that training is also improv training in a way. It's the same thing, which is go out there with nothing, but with great confidence, make something. Yeah. And so that was the first hit of true performance dope, as I like to call it. Right. We also had to take a creative writing course. And there were like a couple different options, like essay writing. Or whatever. For whatever reason, I chose screenwriting. So this is all part of journalism, prerequisite, whatever. Yep. Knowing what I know now. Oh, you're teaching me how to 
create a documentary or write out a story doc. Right. You know, before you write a script, you must think about where you're going. What story are you trying to tell? So the script writing class was very pivotal too. And like the entertainment juices starting Mm -hmm. to flow. Yep. And so I had always been curious about stand-up comedy. I went and watched it a couple of times. I went to Florida A&M, but Florida State had comedy more frequently. Mm -hmm. And so I would go over to Florida State and watch their stand-up shows once a week or whatever, just to see who was in it. Bobby Lee, like, was there. Like, like just guys that are just titans now, but at the time were just just on the rise. Aerie Spears, like, a lot of a lot of the Mad TV folks, some SNL. Um, and so at the same time, me and my buddies were still in jeans from the mall. Like, that's my, that's just my thing. I wanted to look nice. It was not some big, cause, you, know, you know what's fucked up about getting arrested in this country is that, the police automatically assume you to be doing more than what they caught you for. Like the, I like the concept of petty crime does not exist in our society psyche anymore. It can't just be a kid being a kid. It's just, Oh no, what were you up to? What else are you doing? Are you dealing with Al Qaeda? It's like, I'm sorry, what? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Credit card fraud ring that's tied to Al Qaeda. And Al Qaeda has been using credit cards to purchase it. Hey, man, I took a credit card that wasn't mine. I bought some jeans to impress a girl that lives up the street from campus. That's what I did, okay? That's all it was. So yeah, this idea of going to prison or thinking or assuming I was going to prison, that was enough for me to go, well, let me try comedy. Yeah. But then, but here, here's the upside, though. I got suspended from school for a, like almost a year. For what? Because you can't, be enrolled and commit felonies. They're like, you need to go somewhere and sit your ass down. Mm -hmm. Because I'm working in the campus post office at the time. And so that's where we're getting the credit cards from. So if you commit the crime, you took the credit card from campus. So therefore, that is the crime that we are going to suspend you on. Right. Even if the the feds go, we're just going to hit you for credit card as the actual charge, you still did this act on campus. Yeah. And that is duplicitous. That is not reflective of a rat lab. Get the fuck off the campus. <laughs> so I'm suspended, but then I get my financial aid check. I still, got whatever, God bless the federal student loan inefficiency. And knowing what I know now, they just sent me the money so that they could keep hitting my ass with the interest. But I had a check for $8,000 and nowhere and nothing to do for like five months. All right, let's go do some open mics. And so that money became the front money for the beginning of me doing open mics around the South, just yeah. like riding a bus. You know, for the most part, I was sleeping the bus day. I hoarded the money because I didn't know what I would get it, you know, get me more. But I paid rent off of Golden Corral and the financial aid money. That was the money I used to start my comedy career. And then I get back in school and just fucking Dean's list the rest of the year. Cause at this point, my mom, my mom found out like no one knows that I'm doing this shit. Cause I know my mom's not going to approve. Cause you know, Hey, I almost went to jail, but uh, I got it figured out. Joyce, I'm going to just sleep in bus stations <laughs> <laughs> and stand up will be my way. Out. Trust me. Yeah. Everything's fine. College administrator of 40 years. <laughs> this is a solid plan. So, one of her students saw me sleeping in the bus station and snitched on me. And that's how my mom found out I was doing comedy. It's like, oh, at this point, I was almost a year into it. And she asked me to stop. And I refused. And I said, well, how about this? If I make good grades, because my grades were shaky up until that point. Like I was like a two, three, two, mm-hmm. four yeah. student. I go, how about this? If I make good grades while I do comedy, you have to shut the fuck up. About, like not like that but like that was right. the basic deal right if i make good grades you have no say on anything else that happens in florida and she goes cool and then i made dean's list and then she bought me a car so that i wouldn't sleep in a bus station when did she come see your comedy for the first time year three year two did she like it no i bombed it was a coffee shop gig it was like it's like one of the one of those rare bombs like a local bomb 
mm-hmm. coffee machine was still going on. Like she didn't see me at the Ramada Inn where I normally do well. She saw, like she came and saw an open mic because she was in town for some other shit. Yeah. And I bombed. And that was her image of me doing comedy for like the next like fucking three, four years. And then when I, when I, I graduated and I moved back to Birmingham and I started performing at the Stardome, which is like the big time club. There still is. And the Stardome, again, her students and her coworkers would see me and they would go to her and go, we saw your son. Your son is funny. And enough of that. And then my mom was like, okay, well, let me, let me go investigate this stuff. I was going to say it was such a nice moment. And to those of you listening who haven't seen Roy's uh, set on the White House Correspondents Dinner, I thought some, a moment that gave me chills is you're very funny. You've got really good jokes. You're in control. And then at the end, you take a minute and you talk about why are we all here? This is to raise uh, money and donations for young correspondents. This is to try and uh, help get responsible young journalists out there and give them a start. You talk about the uh, lack of support for local news and how important local news is. And you give a shout out to your mom, who's, they put a camera on her, um, and you can tell that this is an amazing full circle. I got all these chills, you know? Yeah. Now, to, I also may have been ill. <laughs> I, have a, I may have had an infection. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got really sick. No, uh, I did. Did you did. have I, the fish or the steak? <laughs> I had both. Um, now, full circle for sure. You know, my mom, my mom lives a life of, you know, she's just in the shadow. She helps people. Like I, I would argue, it's not even an argument. My mom has done more for people in the city of Birmingham than I could ever do. Just from the countless students that she's helped get across the graduation stage yeah. and into their careers who are now prospering within the city. I it, It's interesting in that I can be in public and I can have people come up and go, I love the Daily Show. But when I'm in Birmingham, it's people coming up and telling me stories about my mom. Yeah. Man, let me tell you, man, your mama made sure that I, da, 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 and I got pregnant and my mama made, your mama made sure I didn't drop out. Of that. So she doesn't hear those stories. She doesn't get told thank you enough, in my opinion, for just everything that she's ever done. Not just yeah. for me, but just for, this is, Thank you for everything. Sure. Just a whole life thing. Let me yeah. just knock that out real fast. 